Let's say 8 o'clock. Let's go ahead and at least open up in prayer and start so we can be faithful with your guys' time. Um, and we do have uh, Sunny's also here as well. Is she on or did she leave? No, she'll be, she'll be sitting oh. down momentarily. Okay. All right. Well, let's open up in prayer. Avinu Makinu, our Father, our King, thank you so much for this day, this evening, this time. Um, again, for such a wonderful meal and the opportunity to sit here and be able to not get disrupted with Wi-Fi so much as we were teaching and um, being able to be in your presence and to learn. And uh, this is going to be a fun and exciting lesson, Lord. So I pray that you would help everyone to capture everything. Help me to be able to... Uh, relate this that's on my heart and that the, and what we've studied and to continue on that fashion lord we just give you this time and we honor your honor your time with or honor our time by by putting you in 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 our presence so we just thank you so much for that lord and uh, that we can give you this time of ours and devote it to you and to study you by shem yeshua hamashiach in the name of yeshua we all said amen amen all right so more people are coming on awesome Oh, okay, I'm not letting you any of you in. It must be David. David must be letting you people in. That's awesome. Oh, wow, they're just coming on automatically. That's great. That's excellent. All right, so everybody got out chapter three. Are we ready for chapter three of the, of the idioms of the New Testament? Okay, so in the previous two lessons, we looked at the synonymous parallelisms. And you remember when we talked about those, they were two different thoughts or two exact thoughts or synonymous thoughts going in the same direction, speaking the same truth, talking about the same truth. Um, you know, uh, that person is tall and dark, um, that uh, people have black hair, you know, that kind of idea. It's the same kind of thought process, but going in the same direction. So today we're going to actually learn a little bit something different. And what we're learning today that's a little different is that we're going to learn about what an antithetical parallelism is. An antithetical is something that opposes the first thought. So it's almost like a, 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 a two-sided coin or double-sided teaching. So you have one teaching that'll teach one thing and the other is going to be completely opposite of what the other one is teaching. Okay. So, so what we're going to learn this, this evening is how that, that works in Hebrew poetry. And again, parallelisms are the hallmark of the Hebrew language. So when you get this idea down, when you start reading the Psalms and the Proverbs and the letters and some of, even some of the prophetic words by the prophets, you're going to see that sometimes when they talk and when they speak, and even when Yeshua speaks, sometimes he speaks in these parallelisms using doublets and triplets like we've talked about. Um, and these are going to, today we're going to learn the opposing sides of this teaching. So rabbis would often do a doublet or a triplet even using antithetical parallelisms and not so much synonymous with one another, okay? And something that I do, that I like to do here is that I've been teaching a few extra stuff as we've been going on. So I want to, I want to take some time to look at the, be, uh, not, we talked about the Beatitudes last week, but let's take a, a look, a, a, a student of mine years ago, her name is Nancy, she asked me a question about why there are two different words in the Hebrew for sinners used in, this, in the passage of Psalm 1-1, okay? So when we look at that, we're going to start doing that. So what we want to do is um, uh, take a look at, bless, you know, blessed are the, uh, the passage that, that's in Hebrew. So let's go here, go down. I mean, not in Hebrew, it's in the book of Psalm. If you go down, okay, uh, you'll see Lesson 3, Part 1. And here's what the New International Version reads. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. We've all read that, right? We all know that. Psalm 1-1, it's a very popular passage. A lot of people speak that. Let me uh, let somebody in here. Okay. So a lot of people are used to that. Uh, the King James says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scorn scornful. Now, both translations read very similar, and they hold tremendous wisdom in how we are to walk a blessed life or a blessed life. Now, here's what the Hebrew says, and so we're going to break it down. Now, my, right in front of you, my Hebrew is reading a little bit different because it transposed from uh, MS word on, do, on a, on a, um, on a, um, uh, a GM or IBM style type computer, Microsoft computer, and then to a Max, so sometimes it doesn't catch everything in there. 
But if you look at it in Hebrew, that's kind of what it looks like. You guys should have the paper in front of you. And anybody want to take a stab at it, trying to read it in, um, in Hebrew? Anybody want to try to do that? Yeah, the transliteration is down there. So the transliteration should be there. That'll help you. Who wants to give it a shot? You guys see it? It's in the transliteration. I don't have the paper yet. Oh, you don't? Okay, you never got, uh, email me so I can send you all the lessons, okay? Don't don't text me because it's harder to get from text to email. So email me at rabbiadrian at gmail.com, okay? Rabbiadrian at gmail.com. Uh, Linda, why don't you give it a shot? I'm putting you on the test, but you've got a pretty good idea of how to read Hebrew, but this is how you do it in, in this is how it says in Hebrew. So go ahead, uh, Psalm 1-1. Do you see it? Psalm 1-1, and I think that's what it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Asher. Ashray. Ashray. Uh, ish. Keep going. Asher. Lo. Uh, Lach. Ba. Atza, atza, is that what? No, atza, atza, atza. atza. Okay, yeah. I, I don't. I'll have to look at that closer. Rasaim, uv, dra, drech, hasaim, lo, right. amid. Uv me mo shav la im lo ya sev. Yeah. Shav. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you did pretty good actually for being put on the spot. I'm sorry I put you on the spot. Bashrechaish Ashelo Halach Ba Atsat Reshaim Uv Vederech. Hataim, lo amadov ve moshav, let's im, and then we get the other, I've got to get my thing to the right place, lo yeshav. And, and, and so let's break this down, ashrei. In Hebrew, the, uh, this word ashrei, now you know when we bless uh, uh, like uh, something to drink, we say baruch, baruch hata adonai, Eloheinu malcha olam. When God blesses man, he always uses ashrei. We never use ashrei towards God. Which is interesting. Rabbi, do you do you have any idea or any rabbinical insight behind that at all? No. <laughs> That's good. Ashray, okay. So say it, uh, unmute yourself and say it again. Oh, okay. So um so Ashray. Ashrei is rarely used to, to bless God. We always use Baruch. And one of the reasons why is because God doesn't need our blessings. He blesses us. And he doesn't need to be blessed. And so here, Ashrei means, uh, this is what the word means, blessed. But here, let's break this down a little bit more. When you, It just doesn't mean blessed or happy or elated or exuberant. But it talks about the one who walks straight on. So this particular word, Ashrei, that goes towards towards that God uses towards people or that's written here in Psalm 1 blessed is the man or the person or the male and female blessed is someone who walks straight on neither to the left nor to the right so that means that in for someone just to have a blessing from God you can't just live the way you want to live and commit sin and do all that stuff that person isn't truly the one that's being blessed that's not what this particular Hebrew word goes towards this Hebrew word truly talks about a person who walks straight on a person who's like focused to neither turn to the left nor the right but whose way show what his uh end result will be virtually meaning that happiness lies in wait along the road in this world olam hazeh in the world to come olam haba okay so when a person chooses to walk right with the lord they're going to see god's blessings now and later um uh, for what is promised to us in the, in the kingdom to come. So, so this is really interesting for us to really get this concept. So, you know, when we, you know, there's a different word that we use to bless, you know, when God says, bless your enemies, okay, as opposed to a person being blessed, there's a difference going on here. Uh, what he's asking to do is typically when you bless an, um, a person that is un, 
wavering from their sin. You know what you're asking God to do when you ask, you know, when God says, bless your enemies, does anybody want to speak into that before I do? Anybody want to say anything that they might, they might have an idea? Of? What does it mean to bless your enemies? Go ahead, anybody. It, it's not a right or wrong answer. So it's just whatever you, whatever comes to your heart and your mind. Is it to forgive them? To forgive them, that blesses them. That's right. That's one way. That's an approach. What's another way that when we actually do the action of blessing our neighbors, when we actually do something to bless them or to bless our enemies, specifically our enemies, what do you think God does when we do that? For instance, when we pray for an unbeliever. Well, we're, it, we're, we're but, forgetting what they did to us. It's as if they didn't do it, kind of like what he does to us when we sin. That's He's good. trying to, um, you know, we're not getting even. We're just forgetting about it. And he's, you know, as if it's the same way we want it to be done. <clears throat> not hold them accountable. You know. Those are all really good. And those are, are pretty close to where we're at on that. Let me let somebody else in here real quick. Um, what, what we forget sometimes is that when we, when we actually bless our enemies, it gives room for God to, to bring them to repentance. And so a lot of times they're not going to be blessed financially. They're not going to be blessed spiritually. They're not going to be blessed in the way that we think of the term blessed with us. That, you know, if I say bless you, brother, or bless you, sister, I'm hoping that all of God's goodness comes upon you. But when we bless our enemies, what God does is he removes their all their sin and everything around them to get them broken to the place where they cry out in repentance and call out to God. Do you guys, do you guys catch that? That's, that's really exciting to think about this. So when you bless your enemies, you're not telling God to bless them. Like we would expect to God to bless our brothers and sisters. What we're, what we're telling God is when we, when we bless them, we totally release the, the work that is over them to become a godly work, to bring them to repentance. And it's a beautiful thing because it'll, it'll, it, it, it'll bring them to their knees. So when, so if you have somebody that's really close to you that has been just horrible at work or they're a coworker or they're a boss and they've been really bad for you and they're not believers, when you're praying for them to, to get saved and asking God to bless your enemies in a situation, he's drawing them into repentance. So things will start falling apart around them. <laughs> I don't know how many have ever prayed for your, your children and you've seen things fall apart around them and, and their life is falling apart and you know you've been praying for them to get saved and you're thinking okay <laughs> well, you know Lord I'm praying for blessing why is my kids you know uh, Dave you're wanting to say something I, yeah uh, there's I also a link between Ashray and Halach Halach yep right exactly and that's what I'm trying to get across in this thing here so that's really that's really important for us to capture there. There's the the link between Ashrei and Halach. So it's those two, and that's why you're not really a blessed person from the Lord if you're not walking according to God's way. And and when you read it in the Hebrew, uh, Linda, when you read it in the Hebrew, there's that word Halach. It's right there in the it's right there in the transliteration. So if we look at the transliteration again, you just go up a little bit, go up where we saw the transliteration. You'll see that it's right in there. It says, uh, Ashrei Chaish, blessed is the man who, Asher lo Halach, who does not walk, Halach. And remember, we talked about Halach isn't just to, so much walking, but it's establishing godly principles in your life. It's establishing a godly standard in your life. So it says, Ashrei Chaish, Asher lo Halach, blessed is the person or the, the man who does not choose to walk in a way that is not ungodly. So, Rabbi, correct on this. That is that it's a man who walks in Torah. Halakha is Jewish law. Exactly. So, when, when you're walking according to God's prescription, the blessing flows. Amen. Do you guys catch that? That's really important. That's really cool. So, so when you choose, when, when you hear, in our modern world, when the church tries to teach that Torah or Torah or the, the law is evil or bad or it's we've been set free from the law, they're really doing a misservice because they're not really getting across the true understanding of what Torah is. Torah, like I told you guys, has a distinct, it, it is connected to, to Halach as well as Ashrei. And so they all go together and we have this Halakha that Rabbi said earlier, that means Jewish law. It means 
It's it, it's what you take from the scriptures and how you apply that to your life. How we so, walk out the word. Exactly, how we walk out the word of God. So this whole Psalm 1-1, when you break it down, this word ashray isn't just oh, a true. simple word. It's a huge word that's connected to 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 several concepts. And one of the main concepts is how you choose to walk according to God's word and to, and to allow his word to lead you so that you will not stray one way or, or the other, but you will stay straight on, okay? So we see that in there when we see this word ashray, it's, it's beautiful, it's a huge, huge word here. So, so let, me, let me come down a little bit more. So we see that and it says, and then so happiness takes place in both worlds. Remember we, I preached on joy not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. And when we talked about joy, uh, joy is um, uh, something that is established from the inside, from the spirit of God that comes forward. Uh, Linda, you have your hand raised. Did you want to add anything? Oh, before we go there, um, when you said bless our enemies, that's being good to our enemies. And it says that the goodness of God leads people to repentance. So that goes all along with blessing our enemies. Yep. And, and what's funny, though, is... is it's hard for some people to bless their enemies. Can you imagine like being in an interment camp and trying to bless your captor? But the more you honor them and walk according to God's ways, the more conviction falls on their lives and their life changes. There was a Christian movie that just came out not too long ago. I can't remember the name of it. It was actually a really great movie between um, a, captor, a captor, an English captor, and, or I mean, an English person who was captured by the Japanese during World War II. And this man and this Japanese guy became really close friends at the end of their lives because of forgiveness and greatness and typically so typically when you're asking god to bless your enemies you're not telling god to bless them the way you would expect a believer to get blessed what you're doing is actually leading you know it's in it this is kind of funny i'll say it as a jokingly way but it's kind of true it's like if you have a a dog that's been trained to to be a protective dog and you say sick them <laughs> sick him sick him doggy and the dog goes and then goes after the the enemy in the same way when you release god's god's blessing upon the wicked it gives room for yeshua to go after them and the holy spirit so you know so that's kind of a it's it, in a in a mental way kind of they're thinking of that that's kind of cool in a way so then we have the word haish so in, in i'm breaking it down word for word it means a person or it means singular the man or a person and it's no great surprise here that word in hebrew is singular because again it's referring to any person who chooses to walk and, or practice according to the ways of the lord Okay, so then we have the next one, asher, it's just a relative participle. The word can mean many things, but it is usually translated as who or whom, okay, uh, whomever, which, etc., depending on the right relation to the words. Biblical Hebrew only has about 80,000 words in it, compared to modern day Hebrew, I think, which is um, a couple hundred thousand words that they use in modern Hebrew. And in English, I think we have over 450,000 words in the English language. So biblical Hebrew is only made up of 80,000 words. So it's how words relate to one another in their sentences that really make how you, how you interpret what is being said there, okay? So, um, so that's really good. So lo is, we use that today in modern Hebrew. It just means no, not, or none. It's simple, nothing spectacular to it. But then here's that word halach that Rabbi mentioned earlier. Uh, and I put it here, ah, now we can start seeing a picture being drawn here. We learned in the first lesson that the word just doesn't mean to walk, but it carries with it the path that one walks, the path. We hear Yeshua say something, right? What does Yeshua say? Um, narrow is the gate, or wait, uh, yeah, or narrow is the path and small is the gate that leads to life and wide is the is the gate and the path that leads to destruction so here's the same thing a person who walks according to god's ways a very specific path and chooses to make a path that's very specific is a person that will receive the blessings of the lord in in a positive way uh, does that make sense everybody catch catch your net it's really good okay so it means the path that one walks and so it's application of placing god's law his torah or his way his instructions, because we learned that Torah also means uh, instruction. It comes from the root word yare, which means to cast or to, to throw. Okay, so we learned that a couple of weeks ago. Um, so into your life and how you live. So how you live is important. It's not this grace thing where we just say, oh, I'm saved by grace and I'm saved by grace and I choose to live any way I want to live. 
but it's choosing the right path of how you want to live and walk according to God's ways. And he gives us the grace to fulfill Torah. And that's the difference. Grace isn't to, to, to turn away from Torah and to choose our own direction and to walk away from God. Grace is given so that we have the ability and the strength to walk according to God's path and his ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's how that's really truly what grace is. And like like Rabbi spoke last week, he said grace is favor. His favor. It's this favor. Who doesn't want the favor from the Lord? Well, if you're walking against God's ways, do you think you can have his favor? No. You're going to have his favor when you choose to walk according to his paths. And if you're on the other end of the spectrum, he loves you, but he's going to discipline you even more so to get you back into his presence. So so choosing to walk with him the scriptures promise that you will be blessed by doing that, okay? So we look at it here again, um, uh, neither to the right or to the left. Let's remember the words of Yeshua, enter through the narrow gate. We talked about that. The wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And he goes, and many enter through it. <laughs> you know what You know what gets me more than anything else is my kids don't learn from my mistakes. <laughs> they want to learn their own mistakes. <laughs> And they, they said, but dad, we want to, we want to, you know, I go, yeah, but why reinvent the well? If I'm failing, at least learn what I failed at and fail at something I haven't failed at. So you can learn if you want to really, really learn. But why are you following, making the same mistakes that I did? And it's like, there's this, this concept. And I'm sure I'm making the same mistakes. My dad Williams made. answered that question. It's What's a that? family tradition. <laughs> tradition. Okay, Fiddler on the Roof, man. We got to start watching that now. That's awesome. That's awesome. But it is. It is tradition, and, and, and it's sad, you know. And uh, But here, we know that Yeshua says narrow is the gate that leads to life, and that and we know it's very narrow. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, what we get labeled most of the time with, sadly, is how we get labeled is we're, we're closed-minded or we're narrow-minded people. Well, in a lot of ways, I, I'm thankful for that because I want to be narrow-minded. I don't want to, I've already struggled enough with my mind and everything else that goes on in my head. And I struggle enough with just driving Uber and driving people around that are, or not people around, but people that are out there driving. It's just, it drives you crazy. Um, but the reality is, is that I want to be narrow-minded so I can think on the things of the Lord and think on the pure things of God and think on the, the beautiful things of the Lord. So, so it's nothing wrong with being narrow-minded. It's just your attitude behind it is Typically, when somebody calls Christians narrow-minded, they mean that they don't, you know, they think we're just a bunch of hoity-toities that, that think we're better than they are and all that kind of stuff. And we really aren't better. We're favored, but we're not better. And, and we have to have that humble heart to draw people on. We're better in the sense that we've been set free, but we're not better in the sense that somehow we're a better human being than them. What they object to is our biblical worldview, which exactly. is what guides our life because they don't have a biblical worldview. They have a worldly view. Exactly. And that worldly view allows them to violate everything mm -hmm. that God has established. That's why you have abortion. That's why you have sex outside of marriage. That's why you have all kinds of things, because there are no guideposts. It's mm -hmm. whatever makes you feel good. Yep. And if you, if you heard what Rabbi said, this is very much a world philosophy to the point that if you disagree with them whatsoever, somehow you're wrong. You're narrow minded because, wait, we're all like this. Why don't you accept what we're doing? So true believers really make up a very small percentage of the world, um, the world population out there. And so, yeah, you're right. I mean, to them, they see no wrong with that. That all seems normal to them. And if we have a different view, and this is why they always call us anti. It's funny that it's always anti instead of pro. So we call ourselves pro-life, but they say anti-abortionists, mm -hmm. right? As if abortion is the standard of righteousness, and we happen to be against that standard. But we know what the standard now, it is. It is their standard of righteousness, exactly. unfortunately. And yes, exactly. So, so we have to choose a narrower path, and that narrow, narrow path sometimes puts us as a target on them. I mean, they, they see us as a target. Okay, now we come to this word ba'asat. Ba'asat means in the council of. So asat means council. Ba is the Hebrew word for in the. When it, when it has a ba instead of be, it just means in the. 
in the counsel or in the advice. Now, here's what's awesome about this word. We hear that and it seems to be a simple word, like in the advice or in the counsel of what, you know, hey, let me give you some advice, you know, you know, don't, don't ever take a wooden nickel, you know, <laughs> type of thing you do for people that give you that kind of thing. Okay, this face at face value seems simple in the counsel, but in in the advice of evildoers, this is where we get this word of the root word of asat is etz. And etz, everybody knows what etz is. What is etz? Etz chaim. We, we sing that every week. What does what etz chaim mean? Tree of life, right? We get this word etz, which means tree. Okay, therefore, this is not something, uh, it's not some light advice, but deep-seated, disobedient, grounded advice, which leads to folly and ruin. Oh, come on, man. It's not the, the thing to do to believe in God nowadays. Everybody makes their own way. I mean, come on. I mean, truth is found in every religion. You know, you get all this advice from people all the time. This is many deep. Many ways to God. What? Many ways there to God. Yes. All, religion, all religions lead to the same God. It doesn't matter what you call them. This is deep-seated rebellious or disobedient grounded advice and that's what this word ba'asat means it means to be so deeply entrenched with such evil and wicked advice that it leads to ruin so when somebody gives you if you're not studying the word of god and you're not really seeking the lord on 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 passages and really trying to understand what he's saying and applying that to your life when someone gives you some of this deep-seated advice it doesn't come to you looking evil it doesn't look come to you looking bad it sounds reasonable hey everybody else you know i mean hey darwinism why not we're learning it i mean look around you the earth looks like it's billions and billions of i mean they give you this and it might sound logical or reasonable but it's deep-seated and it's based in disobedience and we know that disobedience right leads to many many things but it also leads to what Rebe a rebellious heart and they, and rebellious heart leads to if you guys have been listening to sophia sophia says it leads to what witchcraft right that witchcraft comes from a rebellious heart so uh, so here you don't want to listen to deep seated disobedient advice okay it's something that's really imp important so um and so it says that sometimes it is something that is rooted so far down that it becomes a blinding effect for the recipient. And, and that's true. So it becomes blinding. So if you listen to, to deep-seated uh, deep seated knowledge from people and you take it to heart and you think how you do, it can lead to ruin. Okay. So um, Rabbi, were you going to say something? Not yet. Oh, okay. Okay. So we come to the next word. I have, I have some commentary on... The next word, but okay, reshaim, reshaim, everybody. It means evil doer. Okay, reshaim. Okay, now again, this is where Nancy, a person that I was teaching Hebrew years and years and years ago, who sur who surpasses me in Hebrew today, she would read a, a a page of Hebrew every single day when she was learning Hebrew, and she's so fast and proficient at it today. It's it's ridiculous. Um, but this reshaim, evildoer, this word is so heavy in the Hebrew that it carries with it not just a sinner, because all have sinned and fall short of God, but of such an evil person that his condemnation has already been passed, for instance, like a, for example, like a criminal. So this person's, which is funny because you don't think that, I mean, it thinks like, well, aren't we going to be uh, waiting till the judgment day? Well, you remember when God showed up to so Sodom and Gomorrah, judgment had already been passed on them. They weren't dead. To stand before the great white throne they were judged right there and god was done with them and he says i'm not going to do this when noah uh was put on the ark god says i cannot contend with men anymore i can't do this anymore they're so wicked all their thoughts are violent everything is evil i must wipe them out so there's judgment already passed on it so this word re, re eshim also is talking about this kind of a person it's it's a criminal it's there, when I was uh, years ago doing anger management, I remember that there was some people in there that could not accept the fact that they had anger in their lives. And what's what's interesting is they had what they called the counselor said they have they go he said what you guys have is what, what we call a prisoner's mindset, um, a criminal mindset. Which means if you talk to most prisoners that have committed crimes and you talk to them, they're going to say, "Well, I didn't do it. That person made me do it." Well, I, I didn't, if that guy wanted to cut me off, I want to, I want to kill him. Or if that woman wanted to dress that way, I want to have done an evil act on her. You know, all these, they blame somebody else for their issues. 
And that's kind of where this is at. When you have a mentality like this, where we blame everybody else for our problems and we can't look inward and we can't find what our own issues are and we can't run to the Lord and run to our rabbis and counselors and, and get prayer and, and all those kind of things. When we can't do those things, we're, we're kind of making ourselves in a place of being judged, okay? So it speaks to a person who's already received sentencing which is really strange. This, this is a really strong word. And if anybody has been involved in prison ministry, you, you can understand what I'm saying. Okay, so Rabbi, you said you wanted to act. Actually, uh, you covered it, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but anybody else have any question on this one? Because this is, this word, uh, reshaim, is a really strong word of a, not just a sinner, but we're talking a sinner who's already been judged before the living God. And this is something that we don't want to, to, you know, take advice in this direction at all, right? So it's, it's interesting. So we have that. So now we come to derech. Derech means way, okay? Derech, believe it or not, is connected to halach as well. The word that we use on halacha for, God, for Jewish law, derech is the same thing. It's talking about the way. And you remember when it talks about the disciples in the, in, in the book of Acts, and it says they were of the way. You know, what do you guys think that they were talking about? In a Jewish concept, in a first century concept, when they said those people are of the way, haderech, what do you guys think that was being said? Let's just open that up for discussion right now real quick. If it helps you to look at, let's look at the definition first and then we'll talk about it. This word comes from the Hebrew root word darach, which means to tread, to bend, to lead. And it's a verb in the hifel stem, which don't worry about that. That's just the Hebrew stuff, which is a causative type. For example, to rebel in the Hefel form in the active voice would be to cause one to rebel. So this word, derech, means to cause one to walk. This is the, the, the rooting of this, okay? So this is not just a casual trip or a journey on the road in which a person goes, but more so a path of learning, knowledge, wisdom, and etc. So the scriptures are giving us, you know, Yeshua says, Ani haderech, I am the way. When he said he is the way, he's talking about he is the path. He's the one that's got the knowledge of the path of wisdom and righteousness for your life. And it's not a casual walk. It's a tough one. And he says few will find it. Few will take that walk. It's, it's such a beautiful word. This word derech leading to the, now think about the disciples in Acts when it talks about them being part of the way. Now reading this definition, what do you guys think? that was referring to in the book of Acts. When they were all in one accord. Amen, that's part of it. Anything else? Messianic believers. They were Messianic believers and that's, that's the key right there. They just weren't one with one another, okay? Which is re really good though, Dana, that's really important to understand that concept. But when people looked at them, they said, oh, my gosh, these people are following the Messiah, the way of the Messiah. What's that? What's that? Yep. Messianic Messianic. They were following the way of the Messiah. And when they were following the way of the Messiah, this way, this concept, they're like, oh, my goodness. And this is why I said and. And their numbers were added upon on daily. I mean, you see 5,000, you see thousands and thousands and thousands of people believing it because they all realize this is the way to the Messiah. This is the Messiah's walk. This is what we're called to do. So when, when you hear this term, they were of the way, they were, they were being very direct in this of saying, man, that is the way to walk. And these people are part of this. I want, I want to see what's going on here because this is, this is how they walked in God. So it wasn't a light matter in those days where they just chose a path. Um, I may have some guests this upcoming weekend. His name is Vishnu. He's a guru. And he lives right next door to me and his wife that lives with him or so-called wife or whatever. But they want to come. You know, they're the kinds that sit around and, and you know, the, bank, the, the little um, tambourines and do all kinds of meditations and all that. But they believe that 
the truth is the truth no matter what. Well, they might show up this weekend. So everybody be loving and kind and all that kind of stuff. They're my neighbors and I'm witnessing to them, but I'm going about it in a very, very general light way right now. And so if they show up, they're gonna, you're gonna see some gu a guru and his wife show up this weekend, possibly. So we'll see if they're there. Okay, just don't start chanting or, or yeah, casting demons out or anything. anointing away already. <laughs> A spray yeah. gun. <laughs> I, like to, I like to just see Yeshua get in there and just disturb their spirits. Just get in there and disturb their because they are an enemy when it comes to the truth, right? They aren't my enemies, but but their doctrine and their theologies and their understanding is. So anyhow, this is a uh, direct isn't just a way or a path. You know, go down here and take a ride on university type of thing. That's not that's not what it is. Like this is these people found what we've been hoping for and waiting for and what Daniel prophesied about. This is why so many thousand, it says even in there, this is why many, even in the, in the, uh, of the priests, it says many of the priests came to the faith. Many of the people that were already serving in the temple, uh, being rabbis and, and many of the priests started finding Yeshua as the Messiah because this was what they were looking for. And, and despite of what you hear in modern Judaism today, where, or you, you hear this even in Christianity, where it says most of the Jews rejected Jesus. And there's this mentality out there. And this is where Hitler and everybody else says that, you know, um, the Jews, they, you know, the Jews uh, uh, rejected Christ. The Jews didn't reject Christ. It no. was particular yeah. Jews that re uh, uh, chose to not believe in him, which was part of, they were part of the Pharisaical sect. In 90 AD, go ahead, David. When they tell the story uh, about what led up to the crucifixion and the, the, the high priest is talking to his cohorts and says, we better do this under the cover of darkness for fear the people may revolt. Well, why would the people revolt if they weren't pro Yeshua? Exactly. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's exciting, guys. I mean, be excited about that because that's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing thing. And so, and in the there are some accounts anywhere from 250. I've heard. I I think the real number is more like 500,000, 400,000. But they would say between 250,000 to 1 million people during before the turn of the century, Jewish people believed in Messiah. You know, just the the walk down the Mount of Olives to come into Jerusalem. Can you picture the scene in your head? Yeah. With these throngs of people who are shouting out Hoshana Ben David, oh, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai, and they're throwing down palm branches and they're throwing down their tali toe oh. and they're giving a welcome the likes of which you've never seen. I mean, but people don't get it. They don't understand that there were tens of thousands there who who were supporters of Yeshua. Amen. And even when he lost a number of uh, believers or people that were receiving him, remember when they couldn't take his teaching on drinking his, his blood and eating his flesh and they just, wow, this is a hard teaching. It wasn't a hard teaching because he was teaching cannibalism. It was a hard teaching because he was calling himself the Passover lamb and they couldn't accept that. They were like, oh my goodness, I, is this really truly the Passover lamb? Is this the Pesach? Is this really him? And if it is him, I don't know if I, if I can do this. And, and but yet he, he won them all. It seems like he won them all over again, because after the resurrection and all this stuff happened and, and everything took place, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Jewish people believed in him. And it really wasn't until really late um, that Gentiles really started coming in. And even then, it wasn't even top heavy non-Jewish until like 200 plus A.D., when Jews at that point were starting to be forced to eat pork and, and everything else and denounce their Judaism that a lot of, you know, so they kind of got started getting separated at that point. And there is a fun, I mean, it's fun to look at the two lines of Judaism and Christianity and see where they came from and look at all that, but that's not important. The key is, I mean, that's important for another date and another time that's going to be taught about if people are into history, but there, you got to understand that today's Judaism is not first century Judaism. And we have to understand this. It's, you know, what we look at nominal Judaism today with conservative reform, um, Hasidic Judaism, all of these are a stand that came out from 90 AD 
of the, of the Council of Yavne. And the churches that we see today, even Protestant churches, are stemmed out of what took place in 325 AD with Constantinople, with the Council of Const uh, Nicaea, that has become more or less Catholicism. Even the reforms and everything that moved away from Catholicism, it's still a faction of Catholicism because it's following the same doctrines of many things. So we see two streams today of Christianity and Judaism that weren't really what was going on in first century so-called Judaism. First and century. if you back it up even further, I, I break it into two, two separate and distinct categories. First is the Hebrews. Right. And Hebrews is the Bible all the way up to the Babylonian dispersion. Exactly. And out of the Babylonian dispersion came the Jews. And they brought with them this creation called the synagogue, the synagogue. That's right. And so by the time of Yeshua, you had the synagogue and rabbis all over Israel, who were ministers. And Sadducees and Pharisees. Right. And then you had the temple and its priesthood, both operating at the same time. Right. I mean, it, know, it was it, yoga. <laughs> it's true. It was. And, you know, there is, there's a, a lot of times we just read of the uh, three sects of, of, of Jews during those days, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the... Uh, um, uh, the Samaritans are really, believe it or not, they were considered dogs, but that's still a sect of Judaism. They were half, they were considered part Jewish. Okay, you have, but there was several of them down there, especially the Essenes, the Dead Sea, right. uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. They actually, um, they, they uh, rejected all of the temple. They rejected everything. And they became a sect that was unto themselves. And some people try to throw John the Baptist in there. And I don't agree with that. And one of the reasons why I don't is John the Baptist was out in the world, in the area, preaching to people repentance and leading the, so for him to do that, he wouldn't have been welcomed into the Essenes because the Essenes believe were very, it's almost like a Masonic type of lodge that we get our men or, uh, you know, you're part of a sect of Jews. It was a that close society. Yeah, yeah, it was a closed society and you had to do a lot of stuff to become part of that society. So, um, but anyhow, there was a lot of sects during the first century and it, there wasn't really anything that we would call Judaism at the time. It was called the practices or halakha or halachot of the Jews. And you had certain practices, halakha, certain uh, halakha of the Jews in Judea and the Jews in Galilee and the Jews in Samaria. There was in, in, in Alexandria, Egypt, there was a different halakha for them because they read the Septuagint, which was the Torah in Greek. Okay, so there's there's a lot of the. Let me turn on my phone. I'm sorry, I didn't even know I had the volume on. Um, so there's a lot of sects of Judaism during that time. So when they saw the disciples of Yeshua, and and they recognized what was going on here, it was a distinct movement that that was led by love, that was led by total total. Um, um, acceptance and and re and forgiveness of sins and all of this stuff to the point where they were even selling their homes and everything and everybody there was no one lacking among them when people saw that there was a tremendous amount of hope in the first century to say these are the people of the way sure they because of Yeshua what they were seeing was that the spirit of the law was more important than the letter of the law and amen. they were seeing that in practice by Yeshua amen I like to use an example for that. I'll just use this piece of paper. This is great. He said that the spirit of the law, this is great. So if this is your property, the Tanakh tells us uh, don't, don't gather from the corners of your property, right? And, and so they would make a certain designation and say, okay, from these corners right here, these four corners, I leave it for the poor and they can come. You're fulfilling the law. You're fulfilling the letter of the law. But what is the spirit of the law does is the spirit of the law draws a tiny little circle in the center. And says, this is all me and my family needs. Everybody else can come and get. If they're still following the letter of the law. And I mean, these people are accurate. You know, you get some people who are dead set on the Torah. You know, oh, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do, you do all that. And they're so dead set on this spiritual aspect of the law. They're following the letter of the law. But the spirit of the law says, hey, this is all I need. This is what you come and, come and receive. Come and receive. And that's how we treat one another as brothers and sisters in, in Messiah. And this is obviously what was going on in the first century. 
This is powerful stuff that was going on. Um, and it was changing the lives of hundreds of thousands of Jewish people until Rome surrounded Jerusalem. This was powerful. And one of the reasons that uh, they got in trouble or the Messianic Jews at that time later on by 135 AD weren't even accepted anymore is because they did exactly what Yeshua told them to do. When Yeshua said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, get up. If you're on there, you know, if you're out in the field or you're up there, get out of here and get out of Dodge because it, it's going to be unbearable. And it was, I mean, it was like blood going down the streets of Jerusalem. It was a slaughter. And because the Messianic Jews listened to Yeshua and left, the other Jews that remained that didn't believe in the Messiah started pitting against them. And believe it or not, there was Jewish against Jewish blood being spilt as well when the Messianic Jews tried to make their way back. And by the second Jewish revolt of 132 to 135, they weren't even accepted as Jewish people anymore. So there was a deep-seated hatred that is built into modern Judaism and modern Christianity today. Am I, am I good for adding to that, Rabbi? I mean, is that kind of your understanding as well? Absolutely. I think okay. it's a, right on. Okay, great. All right, guys, so let's keep going down here. Let's take a look down here um, where we're at. So anyhow, um, uh, where was that? Uh, yeah, Reshaim. And it says here that it causes another person to be bent towards disciplined, disciplined, led, or deceived. And, and Yeshua says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill or uphold them. And I tell you this truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be by any means disappear from the Torah until everything is accomplished. And then he goes on to say this, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so, mm -hmm. to do the same, yeah, will be called please. least into the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I really truly believe that this passage is also referring to this Psalm 1-1, where it's talking about the Reshaim. They were giving wicked, evil advice that was not doing it. Even Yeshua says, man, you guys go, you cross seas to get one convert and you turn him more into the son of hell than you are. That's, <laughs> or the why, son of the that, that's why he said, do as they say, not as they do. Exactly. Exactly. So so this is, these are, these reshaim are evildoers, but it also means sinners. So that's, this is where Nancy came and said, well, why does it use two words here? Okay, now this is where it gets kind of fun. We get to this next word here and it call, it's chataim, okay, or chataim, which means sinners. In the basic form, this simply means to miss the mark. And that's what sinning is. If you're, if you're pointing an arrow at something, you're shooting at a target and somebody hits your elbow or, or, you, or you get distracted or you go like this, and you let it go and you hit your neighbor's dog, you know. <laughs> At a totally different angle. Okay, you've missed the mark big time here. Okay, so when you sin, you miss the mark. And it's this, that's the simplest form of what that means. But here it says it's referring to a sinner like all of us used to be and from time to time continue to miss the mark. The root of it is simply to miss, to incur guilt, to miss the way, etc. However, from the same root derives the word chata'a. Okay, chata'a as in sacrifice and offerings. So you have chata'im, which means a sinner, one who misses the mark, and the same from the same root is built this word called chata'a, which means sacrifice, offerings. So this is pretty powerful to get this. So um, sacrifice and offerings, you did not desire, but my ears, okay, so here's a scripture. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. Burn offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Psalm 40 verse 6. So there's hope for us in this world, or uh, in this word, chata'a, because for every chata, for every sin, there is a chata'a, a sacrifice. You guys catching that? So when Yeshua took on all the sins of the world, he became our chata'a. He became our sacrifice. Okay, he became our, he, the Pesach is the lamb, the Passover lamb, but he, he took on upon himself all of this chata'a, all the sin that is out there. He became this sacrifice for us because he took on our chata'im, he took on our sins. Isn't that great? It's this beautiful picture that we see in Psalms. And, and it's it, Psalm 1-1 is just absolutely amazing when you break it down like this. Okay, so we just keep moving on unless somebody has something to add or somebody wants to say anything. I, I just... On Yom Kippur, there is a very famous prayer 
that's recited in most synagogues. Uh, many Messianic synagogues do not recite it. We do. It's called the al mm -hmm. And it's for the sin I committed. And for each of the sins that's enunciated, you beat over your heart. Mm -hmm. For the sin I committed by idle words. For the sin I committed by... And when what's interesting is that when you look at the list of the sins, the preponderance are sins of the tongue. Hmm. 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 Everybody, don't use your tongue whenever you talk. <laughs> don't even use your lip. <laughs> That's right. I never left my mouth. Yeah. You know, it's like you repent of all vows, call me Dre, right? You repent of all vows. You do, we do all kinds of stuff. When you said that, I thought you were saying D O W E L S. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's I awesome. I promise to only use consonants from here on out. Amen. Like Hebrew, how we read Hebrew and, and modern Hebrew. That's it's hard to do it that way, actually. So we come to the get. So we come to this next word again, low. And it means simple. It's nothing spectacular. It just means no, not, none, just like it was before. Now we come to the word amad. Amad means to stand. In Hebrew, this is a root word which carries with it not only to stand, but to take one's stance. So this means, like, you ever watch uh, Dances with Wolves, that movie years yeah, ago? Yeah, loved it. Yeah, you remember the lady's name, the Indian lady, and they called her uh, uh, Stands with Wolves? with one fist. Yeah, or they, yeah, they call her stands with fists because she gets up and she makes this, you know, she stood yeah. with the stands with fists. In a lot of ways, this is what the Bible is saying here is that someone who does not take a deep rooted stance in, with evil, evildoers advice, that you're not going to rebel to such a way that you can't even, it's like you're in quicksand and you want nobody to pull you out. That talk about pride here. This is huge. So in Hebrew, again, this word carries with it, not only stand, but to take one's stance, to remain, to endure basically establish a stance to remain for the long haul okay so that's a mod and then with the mod and, and the way the hebrew plays these words i love it because a lot of these words are connected but they give a real clear picture of kind of what's going on here it's like a kid when you could ask a kid over and over and over again did you eat those cookies and they got chocolate chip all around them and they got they got their hands are you know filled with chocolate chip and everything and they're like no no and they will not I mean, say what's that not me. I didn't have them. <laughs> Not me. And, and they will stand on that truth. And that's what it's really sad about here is that people are that, that make a strong stance. That's against. my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's the concept behind here because it's so deep seated and, and rooted down deeply. Okay. Then we come to this word Moshav. Moshav oh, is to make a Can we go back to Ahmad for a minute? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. From this root comes... The standing prayer in Hebrew, the Amida. The Amida, right? Exactly. You guys catch that? The Amida. Yep. So it means so in the, the positive sense of this word, it means it means blessed is the person who takes a stand and stands up and righteously for God's ways. And the Amida is is a great the standing prayers. You have the Abo. You have a whole bunch of. If you ever look at a traditional uh, uh, sidur, it is like filled with like a whole bunch of prayers for the Amidah. And if you did every single one of those prayers, you'd be there all night <laughs> or all morning. And very tired because they're all said standing. Yeah, they're all standing. Yep, exactly. So you get to this word Moshav, and that means to make assembly or to sit or to dwell. Moshav, okay? And the root of the noun is Yeshav, which also, which it, and it means to make one's dwelling, to establish roots or to dwell. So Yeshav, Moshav, they all come from the same root of this okay. word. Ruler. Moshav job has for all intents and purposes replaced the kibbutz in Israel. Mm. Wow. Wow, that's wild. So you guys there, you guys hear that? Very few, it, it, there are very few kibbutzim left in Israel. Really? That that is a thing of the past. And they've migrated the uh, to a Moshav, which has much less in the way of restrictions. You're not required to put your salary into a communal pot. You can own your own house, but they still dwell in community. 
Right. And that was the key to the modern day Moshav in Israel, that they live in community, that they establish a community. Very good. Very good. You know, I, I think the Jewish people understand community so much better than Christians do. And, uh, you know, Linda was looking, she had grown up as a pastor's daughter, a PK, a preacher's kid, but she grew up for years and years and years desiring and longing for community. And you know what got her into the Messianic movement and kept her in the Messianic movement is when she went to El Shaddai years ago, when Asher and Trader was just kind of leaving El Shaddai and, um, and Ted Simon was coming in, is that she recognized this sense of community that she was longing for. She was longing for it. Linda, do you want to add to that at all? You want to speak into that at all? Uh, dwelling at El Shaddai? Well, one of the things that I could see that community happened is just history over centuries. Jewish people had to maintain a sense of community just to survive. And so uh, it happened easily. Well, I don't want to say easily, but, you know, through God's help at El Shaddai being believers in Messiah. But in general, um, I got a taste of Jewish community. I dated a coworker who was Jewish and saw community there. And so that's how I saw the beginning of true community in contrast to American independence or, yeah. you know, American independence spirit, I should say. All right. All right. Yeah. Go West, young man. You can do it on your own. Everything's about you. It's, and you know, a lot of times when we read the scriptures, we read it in the context of individual, uh, individualism. What does the Bible have for me? And a lot of times we don't realize that there's Sunny. Everybody say hi to Sunny. Rabbi turned it towards Sunny so she could see it all. Um, she's here tonight as well. Today's her birthday, 83rd birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Yes. Sunny. There's no way I would have guessed they, uh, Sunny's age at all. There's no way. I would have not even come close. Um, so this is this is so true about community is that even nominal Jews, Jews that don't believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, understand community in ways that the church hasn't been able to grasp. And I think a lot of that comes with, there's a lot of worship songs in Jewish, in Jewish circles that is surrounded by anachnu. You guys know what that word is? Anachnu? Anachnu is the Hebrew word for we, us. You see a lot of worship surrounded by us. We, we come before you, Lord. We bow before you. Our hearts are broken before you. There's a lot of worship in the Sidurim. If you read any Sidurim, you pick up any Sidur, and you read the Sidur, and you read most of the prayers or, or the songs that are in there, it's a very collective type of mentality. They think collectively. This is why many Jews in America are Democrats, because they think of still in a tribal mentality, even though they want nothing to do with religion, they still think tribally as we, the people of God, we are, we are, you know, we're, we're, we're part of the, you know, it's like the tribe, we're the tribe, we're part of the tribe. Christians, a lot of worship songs in Christianity, which I love the worship song, so I'm not putting it down, but I'm just showing you the distinctions between the two, is a lot of Christian songs is I. There's a lot of I in worship songs in Christianity, and it becomes my faith, and, and it's what God wants to do for me that becomes so important. Yes, David? It's the same thing with prayer. Exactly. There's a difference between Hebraic mindset and prayer and the Greco-Roman mindset, which is the church. The church's mindset is bless this child, bless this house, bless this car, where the Hebraic mindset is blessed art thou, O Lord, king of the universe who gave us this car. Yes. Do you see the difference? Yeah. The blessing goes to the giver of all things rather than to the object. And it, it makes a tremendous difference in our prayer life. Amen. Amen. And that is so true. And that's why, that's why it's important for us to cultivate that, that uh, sense of community. Because it's not all about us. 
individually or me individually. It's all about us together. And this is why Paul uses the body as an example. And he uses husband and wives as an example to get across a lot of his teachings and meanings because we can't separate ourselves and somehow think that we're going to be okay. And I don't need anybody. I'm a big finger and I, I, I point the way and I could do whatever I want to do. And I, you know, I can point at you and I can, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and Paul's saying, wait, get, you're part of the body here. Get back in here. You're part of the hand. Line up, buddy. <laughs> That's how we describe Beth Yeshua, a set-apart messianic community. Amen. Amen. And that's, and you know what, believe it or not, Jewish people will recognize that. And so Jewish, if you're of Jewish evangelism, Jewish evangelism 101 is all about community. It's all about community. It's embracing each other. And sometimes they don't care. Some, I, I, I'll tell you, I ran a lot across a lot of Jews especially conservative Jews that don't care that I believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Right. They love me because I was part of the community. And I, and because I accepted them wholeheartedly first in the, in the ways of a community. And that gave me room to speak into their lives. And right. a lot of times in Christianity, I hate it when I, I remember when I was a young believer in the Lord and you'd meet somebody, they'd always say, Oh, what church do you go to? And as soon as you said, Oh, I go to Scapoos Foursquare, or I go to First Baptist Church, or if I go to I go to Assemblies of God, bam, right there and then you are put into a category of whether they agree with you or disagree with you, whether you're false doctrine or you're a, you're one of those tongue speakers, or you're you're this or you're that. And instantly you're defined by by what denomination or what group you hang out with instead of just being a believer. And to Jews, they're Jews. Now, obviously, they can recognize or uh, Hasidic Judaism and, you know, conservatives and, and, you know, they can, there's different sects of Judaism, but they still don't argue whether or not you're accepted as Jews, except for only the Messianics. But I believe we're not too far away from that. I believe that just how Hasidic Judaism with Baal Shem Tov 250 years ago, they were all outcasts. They were all, they were all told, oh, man, you're a cult. You're not Jews. We will not accept you. But Israel is the, the, the government in Israel isn't, is, is recognizing the messianic movement. Um, and it's actually, you know, um, discriminatory uh, towards it that made some current rules. Um, and they try to say that, you know, we don't allow you to convert people. It's Can not I, about converting people. That. Right. Can I address that? Yeah. In 1948, Israel adopted a parliamentary system that we would not find comfortable. Right. The Knesset in Israel has to have a consensus in order to form a government. That means that you have people who believe widely disparaging things coming together to form a government. And if you, if, if you want to understand why Israel has so many elections, it's because of this process. And in order to achieve a minority, disproportionate power was given to the Orthodox Jewish community. And the one post that they coveted and said we must have was the ministry that determines who gets citizenship. Right. And the whole reason oh. for that was to keep us out. And the ones who have the biggest voice in the Knesset are the Hasidim, the Orthodox. You no, know, they're the smallest. They do have the biggest voice the because without them, you can't form a government. Exactly. Well, we, but I would think that the Messianic movement must be a threat to them for some of the things they've done recently. Oh, it is. And I'm thinking, well, that's God's hand working because obviously you wouldn't make all those choices and, and rules if you didn't see it. That you right. know what it is no. the truth just like no, in jesus's no, day no, no no you're missing no it. no let me, let me show you where it comes from there the longest recorded hatred in the history of mankind is the hatred of the church against the jewish people well that's true that's true if you look at that history you will understand why jewish people look on christians as the enemy uh the, on the way to the Crusades, it, 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 the, many of the Crusaders passed through Germany and wiped out one third of the Jewish population by whatever means was handled, including 
uh, barring the doors on synagogues that were filled with men, women, and children, setting them afire and chanting to Deum Ladanus, to God be the glory, as they marched around and watched all these people die. Yeah. So, you know. But they don't do this to the Christians there. This is specific to the messianic what you movement need, there. Yeah. No, that's not exactly true, by the way. But they have less of a problem with the Christian because they know where he stands. Mm -hmm. And the, their fear is that these messianic believers are going to spread the good news. And you know what? Their fear is justified because they are. I mean, but that's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. That's the threat. That's the threat to them. By leaps and bounds in Israel because people are hungry for the truth. Yeah. Right. And that's what I was trying to say, because that, that's that's that is the actual threat that they see. I would I would add. I would, let me let me let's close this part off real quick, because uh, we can talk about this all night. But let me just kind of bring a little uh, commentary to the end of that is that is that I part of what you're saying, Blanca, they Messianic Jews are actually being received by the Jewish people then of and of themselves, but not necessarily the government. The government is still controlled by a very strong or a very small group. But a very right, that's why I was saying it was the government, not not the people, right, the government. Right. Yeah. The people are, are receiving a little bit, but part, a lot of it too is they're like, well, you guys are kind of, they, they're treating the Messianic Jews today like they did the Hasidim 250 years ago with Baal Shem Tov and said basically, well, you're, you might, you might be Jewish, we're not sure, but you're not really part of Jew, you know, they, they don't really know what to do with them. But now today, the Hasidic Jews lead right halakha for a lot of jewish sects okay so the thing is with christian with messianic jews i believe that we will eventually be received as a jewish sect full and fully so um in full and in fully and and that's why it's important for us to make halakha for our own for our own for our own people and for all of amen. us amen uh, so anyhow let's move on because we could talk about this a lot but this you guys are getting the idea behind all this so when we get down here we get to let's which means mockers Proud and haughty men are arrogant. So Proverbs 21, 24 says, The proud and the arrogant man, mocker is his name, he behaves with an overweening pride, excessive confidence. So, so you see here that Psalm 1, 1 is really breaking down the difference between walking a, a very thin uh, choice, a path of God that leads to life. And then Yeshua talks about this throughout the entire uh, Berit Hadashah as opposed to listening to these people that just will lead you down paths of destruction because their judgment has already come upon them. They're, they're doing wickedness to the point where God has already said, you're judged. I mean, this is scary stuff. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Then we come to the next word, low. No, again, like I said, nothing spectacular in that. Then we come to Yashav, which comes from Yoshav that we talked about earlier. So we saw that, uh, see Moshav above. Therefore, Psalm 1-1 in, in the depth of the Hebrew could be understand as this. Going straight ahead, neither to the left nor the right, blessed, it, blessed will be the man who does not establish his path according to the deep-rooted, hardening, and strengthening depth of the condemned evildoer's advice and counsel, and does not lean towards and is not turned towards and caused not to be bent towards the wide-established paths of sinners, and does not take his stance and pitch his tent and cause himself to dwell in... Um, the assembly of the mockers, those who are excessively prideful and arrogant. For that man who does not these things will be blessed among his narrow path, his path in the here and the now and in the world to come. This is Adrian's that's extended, from the extended now amplified Bible. Yeah, well, that's that's my Adrian's extended, extended version. <laughs> For now amplified Bible. <laughs> For now. No, when we're when we're doing Wednesday nights, it's a Bernalstein, Bernalstein. So it's Bernalstein's extended version, extended, extended. But if you guys get the idea there, that's really what it's talking about here is is that you're not going to set up camp like Lot. What Lot did was the worst thing he could have done, and God still spared him. Isn't that amazing? That God's grace and His favor is still amazing because Lot set up his tent with the wickedness of the world, Sodom and Gomorrah, and even to the point where he was offering his daughters. You know, think about that for a minute, uh, because they were wanting the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were wanting to rape the the angels, 
He's like, no, please don't take, don't, please don't do this. Here's my daughters. And he was willing to sacrifice his daughters for this because he had pitched his tent in the wisdom and the counsel of them. God still found grace and he got him out of that situation. But Psalm 1-1 is a good heat of instruction for us to move away from that. So this word ashray at the beginning, the reason I broke down Psalm 1-1 is for last week when we were talking about the Beatitudes, that gives us an opportunity to understand that when Yeshua was speaking to the people, he wasn't saying Baruch. Baruch atah, blessed are you. He was saying Ashrei. And so he was leading them right to Psalm 1-1 in many ways to the, to the Ketuvim, to the writings in their own minds. So being a first century Jewish person, hearing him talk, you would have heard this connection between now the what we have at the Sea of Galilee with him teaching Ashrei and, and all them hearing the Psalms being read in synagogue. Okay, and it's going to give them that connection to this. And so they're like, wow, this is, this is a man who teaches with authority. This is a man, not like the, the rabbis, this guy, this guy, he, he, wow. I mean, he was, they were, he was blowing them out of the water. Amen. Okay. What's tell that? What, tell them what teaching with authority means, because that's critical. Well, okay. Well, I don't know if I can go where you go, but teaching with authority means, teaching with authority means that when you speak, God is speaking, you're speaking as if God is speaking. And that authority carries so much weight. It's this kavod it's this heaviness this weight out there that has been placed on you that 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 when you speak with authority when you speak with god's authority and and when yeshua was speaking with god's authority it was as if god was speaking from the mount from the mount mount uh, from the uh, mount Horeb, where where the wedding feast was taking place between the torah and the people remember it in um uh, the when the torah was being presented i call it a wedding feast because god was really getting married to the people on the covenant, the Torah was the betu, be, uh, the ketubah. It was the wedding contract of God saying, I will be my, you will be my people. I will be your God. You'll be my people. And they said, we'll do whatever you tell us to do. There was, there was this wedding procession that was taking place there. If you guys ever look at it in that perspective, but, but this authority, when Yeshua spoke, it's as if God was speaking to them right there and then. And it, and it meant you better, when he, we better take to heart what he's saying here. That much authority. Is there anything you want to add to that, Rabbi? Yeah, there were very few rabbis in Israel uh, during Yeshua's time that had the ability to speak with authority. There's probably two I can think of, right? Can you think of any more? No. Okay, the two I can think of that spoke with authority that they would have placed similar to Yeshua would have been Gamliel and Shammai, right? Correct. Because there was the school of Gamliel and the school of Shammai during the first century, and then there became the the school of Yeshua, which or Yeshua, which we are all part of that school. We're the school of Yeshua. We're not the school of Shammai or Hillel. Okay, but he spoke with such authority that they were like, "Wow, wow!" I mean, they they couldn't get over. It. And 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 Hillel and Shammai had that kind of reverence towards them, um, even though we know they didn't speak with God's authority the way Yeshua did. They still spoke in such a way that those have been arguments among orthodoxy and Judaism up to this day. Shammai says this, Hillel says this, you know, and they go back and forth and argue with that. And we have to get in there and say, yeah, but Yeshua says this, and that's our truth. And, and that's, that finalizes. And that finalizes. It's not just our truth, but it is the truth. All right, so quick. So now that I got your brain, uh, brains working on, on parallel, you know, I mean, on a on uh, Psalm 1-1 one, one, and where our minds are opened up to these things. Antith antithetical parallels, here's what it is. It's composed of balancing couplets, uh, each of which is the antithesis or the opposite of the other. Okay, let me get this here to where I can go up. This type of parallel parallelism is distinguished by the contrast between the construction's ribs or sides. So we're talking in, in scriptures and we're gonna see, don't let this stuff confuse you because you'll see it. The elements of an antithetical parallelism express opposite sides of the same idea. So the, it's got to be within the same ballpark. Okay. Um, so when you, you have that. So let's look at some examples here in the Tanakh. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. So we just read Psalm 1.1. 1, 1, okay. So look right here. Here's the, here it is. Integrity is equal to... Um, crookedness or not equal it's opposite Integ those that are crooked are opposite of integrity okay then you have here the upright and then the opposite of the upright is the treacherous and then here guides them is different from destroys them you see that 
So this is what an antithetical parallelism is. It basically, it's the opposite sides of the same idea. So the idea here is, is what? Anybody know what the idea in that teaching is? Or the idea is to be taught, to teaching. So the integrity, or integrity, it would be a good, a good thing too. But here, advice or wisdom. Wisdom would be kind of like the topic here because the integrity of the upright, it says it guides them. So this person's walk with their life guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. You guys see that? So when you break it down, you'll see it's speaking two different things. Let's got another one. Um, they collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Oh, it's, oh, they're saying the same similar thought, but in two opposing ways. So you break it down, they collapse, um, fall, we rise, stand upright. And so we, we see that right there, right? Okay, so now let's go to, it's hard where I'm looking at my little thing here. Um, and unjust, an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, but one whose ways is straight is an abomination to the wicked. Do you guys see how that can be broken up here into an opposing idea, but speaking the same things? We have an unjust man is equal to one, uh, one whose ways is straight. Okay, let me, if I gotta get this straight here. Hold on a second. I gotta pull this up a little bit more. I'm not giving away the secret, Rabbi. Okay. Okay, so we have Proverbs 29, 27. Do you guys see unjust, an abomination, and the righteous are opposite of the ones one whose way is straight, an abomination is similar, and then the wicked. Do you guys see how those are different? Do you guys see that there? So uh, anybody have any questions so far about what we're doing? Because this is different from what you learned. Before, you're talking about the same idea, being parallel with each other, going forward into one direction, saying the same thing, but in two different ways. This is saying a, a similar idea, but they're opposed against each other. They're actually, they're actually speaking two different ways that are going on here. Okay, everybody catching that? Look at the next one. The way of a sluggard is like the hedge of thorns. But, but the path of the upright is a level highway. So you can see here the way, the derech of a sluggard, hedge of thorns, the path or a rock, literally the physical path or the road of the upright is a level highway. So we see how they're, they're, two, they're talking about the same idea, which is walking along the path. Both of them are talking about the same thing, but they're opposing one another because the way, the way of, the, of the sluggard is a hedge of thorns, but the path of the right upright is a level highway so once you start catching this is this isn't e as easy as uh, para uh, um, uh, synthetical parallelisms okay this is a little different okay Le but once you see them and you spot them you'll be able to catch them okay some anti uh, examples and anti antithetical parallelism in the new testament whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it <laughs> Okay, pretty, pretty opposing sides, but it's pretty simple teaching. It boils down to this. Hey, a person who spends their whole life trying to find life and putting themselves first and doing all that, they're going to lose their life. They've lost their life because um, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet lose his own soul? And then you have on the bottom side of that, but whoever find, who loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever's willing to humble themselves before Yeshua, whoever's willing to drop their, their, their pride and all that other stuff and accept Yeshua for who he is, the Bible says you'll find, he'll find his life for the sake of Messiah. So you guys see that? See how two different opposing? It's talking about the same kind of concept, but two different sides of the coin or the ribs. These are the ribs it's talking about. So you have opposing ribs and sides here. Okay. Uh, they're, they're doing two different things. Okay, so for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, pride comes before a fall type of thing, right? This is kind of pretty much it's a simple teaching for everyone who exalts himself. I love it. I, I tell this story because Dave's going to get a kick out of this because I'm not Ashkenazi, and he is, and he grew up in New York, and I, was, and, I mean, Dana's from there, and uh, Blanca's from there, um, but in, and a lot of people are from New York, but... Uh, Linda knows what story I'm going to tell here, I think, but um, I always get a kick at how Ashkenazi is like, there's a, so in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, you have a lot of people from the East Coast that, that have a second home and a third home in Jackson or whatever, and they're typically Jewish, very wealthy Jewish 
people, a very affluent community that goes there. And at the at the shul, when people get up to read the Torah portion, you'll 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 hear them do their blessings. You know, Baruch Hatoy Adonai. You know, the Elohim Melchoy Alom, and they're pronouncing the Kamats with an O on it. Okay, so I always get a kick at it because Sephardic Jews don't say that. Sephardic Jews says Baruch Atah Adonai Elohim Melech Alam. So you got this Baruch Hatoy Adonai, and you got the Baruch Atah Adonai. So you have these two different. <laughs> To these two different thoughts and, and one, you know, <laughs> but well here's wait here's where i'm here's where i get humbled big time here's where i get humbled so i was working at the at the security place in the middle of the snowstorm and you know during the winter in jackson and i'm at the hospital and i'm walking and i'm just kind of like laughing or whatever and i was just thinking about the person who just did the torah portion earlier that morning so i'm walking i'm going Baruch Adonai, and i hit the curb because the, there was snow that it got above the curb in the parking lot. I forgot about the curb. And my ah. foot hit the corner of that curb and I went face plowing straight down into the snow. I didn't even have time to put my hands up. I put them up barely, but I got plastered with snow all over. <laughs> All over. I was completely fine, but I stood up and I said, okay, Lord, I won't make fun of Ashkenazi Jews anymore. Okay, I won't make fun anymore. And God humbled me right there on the spot. And when I walked into the, uh, I walked into the, uh, the, nur the nurse nursing home area of the hospital and the ladies that saw me all drenched in, in snow all over like, what happened to you? And I go, oh, I got humbled before the Lord out there. <laughs> so, you know, so in Israel, they have adopted the Sephardic pronunciation exactly. as the uh, language official. Yeah, not exactly. The, not the Ashkenazi. Right. So, so if I ever do, eventually Rabbi wants me to start doing Torah protocols for people to start reading from the Torah portion. Uh, on, I think you're going to learn the, the Sephardic pronunciation, not the Ashkenazi pronunciation. But if you grew up in New York, it's going to be very hard to break that from you. You're just going to do that. No, we're not. We're, I was not. I was not surrounded by Ashkenazi. It was always Sephardic. Always Sephardic Jews. That's really always wild. Because because it, it's very Italian and Greek and Israeli, very that Mediterranean. Our food is similar. Um, it, to me, an Ashkenazi is like a uh, Jew, Polish, Russian. That's not New York. Is way more, at least by by me, it was way more um, yeah. Sephardic. Well, you know, that's uh, interesting. it's interesting that you say because Blanc Blanca has said that as well. But um, it's Sephardic because it's very yeah. Mediterranean in New York. Yeah, but, but here's Italian, what's, Greek, here's what's, yeah, but here's what's really funny about all this is if you were to do a statistical thing about this about. 80% of American, uh, Jewish Americans, whether they're New York, LA, Miami, uh, where we're at, Fort Lauderdale, 80% of most Americans are Ashkenazi with 20% being Sephardic. In Israel, it's flip of that. It's the flip side of that. In Israel, you have about 80% Sephardic and 20% Ashkenazi. So well, you just need to look at the immigration patterns. Where did they come from? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but you're, you're right. In areas of New York, there's definitely a Sephardic presence there. Sephardic. But the majority of new of, of Jews in America, and it's cha changing a little bit. The majority of Jews in America are Sephardic. I mean, are Ashkenazi. Um, and just this past year, in 2019, I think in the summer, sometime or something like that, Israel finally surpassed America with more Jewish people than uh, in Israel. So there's more Jewish people that live in Israel now than that live in America. So that's kind of interesting, right? So they've just now passed that. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, okay. Israel's population is a little over 8 million and a million and a half of those are non-Jews. They're Palestinian or so-called Palestinians. Well, they're Jordanians, they're really. Christians, Muslim. they're yeah. Druze, they're yeah. Arabs, they're whatever. International. Yeah, so that passage in Luke chapter 14, verse 11 that we just read in that story I just said kind of gives you the idea there behind this passage. Basically, those who fall on the rock, God will honor, but don't let the rock fall on you. <laughs> <laughs> right? I say that a lot, but it's, it's a true saying. So whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Again, here, the subject is, is being trusted with like a little bit of money or, or a management of, of something. Or you, if you've given a little bit, if you've given a little to handle and you can't quite do a good job with it or you you can't be trusted with, with the little amount that you you've been trusted with don't expect to be given a lot more 
And then on the other side, if you've been dishonest with a very little, you will be dishonest with much. So it's teaching the same thing here. It's, it's pretty interesting. It's not, te- it's the same idea, opposing sides to it. Okay. And then uh, there's one last one here. Um, let's look at, oh, the, uh, that's it. These are great examples of couplets. So these are couplets of antithetical parallels, parallelism in the Bible, which Yeshua often uses, but he also uses extended couplets. However, they are a little harder to find, but once you see a pattern, then it can relatively be easy to find. For example, let's take a look at just one passage that we continue to go to. And we've talked about this one before, but the passage shows us this pattern of ABC, ABC, or a triplet in Yeshua's teachings. Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So when we break this passage up, now, this is one that we talked about on our first lesson. So look at what it says here. So this is ABC, ABC. This is a triplet that God is, Yeshua is using, and it's an antithetical triplet. Do not, A, do not store for yourselves treasures uh, on earth. Look down at the A below, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You see the two opposing sides? Um, these are ribs. These are ribs. So A and A is a part of one rib. And then now go to B, where moth and rust destroy. Go down to the B down below where moth and rust do not destroy. Mm-hmm. Totally opposite. So that's the second rib on this triplet of teaching. Two opposing sides. The, and we go to C and where thieves break in and still. And we look down at the C below it and where thieves do not break in and still. So this was a very rabbinical way of teaching that the rabbis incorporated so that their disciples could follow along in their teachings. This one is pretty amazing because we don't see this. I mean, how many people have read this passage over and over and over and don't see this antithetical uh, uh, parallelism that's being spoken here that comes out just naturally out of Yeshua? And it, it would have come out naturally to a lot of the rabbis, and, it, and that's a Jewish idea of teaching. So... I mean, the, the, when we talk about the, the Greek mindset and the Hebrew mindset, the Hebrew mindset does stuff like this sometimes automatically because it's so amazing to hold on and capture this stuff. So we see it here where it says, um, uh, store up for yourself, do not store up, and then down below, but store up. And we see these antithetical th- approaches here, a, a, B, and C, A, B, and C. You guys getting the idea here? So as you're reading the scriptures, when you come across some of this stuff, take time. Don't just read the Bible. But study it in a way that the poetry is speaking to you. And, and believe it or not, a lot of the teachings are relatively easy. Uh, they're really, truly easy when Yeshua is teaching these things. And sometimes we can't capture it because we're, make, we're turning it into something that's bigger than what Yeshua is trying to teach. You know, when he says, you know, uh, when he's talking about peacemakers, he truly means being a peacemaker. You know, uh, not, not a heart maker <laughs> with a bunch of vowels. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys know what I'm saying is somebody who brings peace in a situation because you will receive that asher, that ashray. You will receive that blessing that God's desiring you to have. But anyhow, so Yeshua's messages are tr- usually pretty simple. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. By applying the laws and the instructions, our new covenant halakha of Yeshua and the Father, we have been given the promise that our lives will not only be blessed in this journey, but in the journey to come. And that's the beautiful thing of choosing the way that does not walk with the sinner and the mocker and all that, but choosing to establish, to moshav, to to dwell in a place that is deep heart set in the ways of Messiah, because we will receive God's blessings in the here and now. And a lot of that blessing, guys, is the inheritance of a, of a family, of a godly family, having brothers and sisters and having, having papas and, and you know, uh, paters, fathers in the faith and uh, mater, mothers in the faith and having all these things, because these are, these are part of the scripture. And this is why understanding community and being collective, understanding this idea of collective, not being, not being um, what do you call it, communist in, in that mindset and not being brainwashed where we all we have to go to the rabbi and get permission where you remember there was that shepherding movement that was happening in the eighties um, and somewhat in the ni- early nineties, the shepherding movement, a lot of people didn't even do anything unless their rabbi told them or their pastor told them, yes, you can go do that. They would always run to their pastor for everything and they'd be covered by this shepherding movement. Now you, should you go to the rabbi 
to me and to Rabbi David and and other leaders. Yes, you should always go to other. Should you go? Uh, you should always go and ask for advice because you're going to get advice that isn't coming from the chataim, <laughs> from the evildoers. You're getting advice that's coming from the righteous, and and it's nothing wrong with asking. Now we're not going to tell you you have to do this because that's not our job. Our job is to simply try to help lead you to the scripture so you can find the right path that Yeshua wants, and you walk on it. But believe it or not, a lot of the paths that we walk on are going to be very corporate. They're going to be very corporate together. Not everyone is called. I think Linda and I talked about this, and I think Sophia taught this on Monday night. Not everyone is called to have this huge, massive ministry out there, okay? Because, but, but we're all called to be a part of the kingdom of God together and walking together and being strong for one another. Uh, when someone's weak, we all feel it. We all work together to help that person up. And that's really what we want to do. So hopefully this teaching helps us understand a little bit this idea of how Yeshua does these, a very, very gentle teaching. But today we learned how he says the same thing in opposing ways and in that one passage that we use a lot in matthew chapter six it, we see the triplet that's being taught there and we see the opposing ribs or the opposing sides of that passage everybody capturing all capturing all that getting that okay open the uh, question and answer time if there's not we'll close in prayer but anybody have any questions it's okay awesome teaching thank you brother thank you Thank you so much. Because of the good meal you had. <laughs> Amen. 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 If you feed him, he will teach. You're yeah. right. <laughs> oh, and by the way, since we're talking about Jewish idioms, uh, when I said take your rabbis out to lunch, that's not an idiom. That's that's very much a true thing. Take your take Rabbi David and uh, Jackie out to lunch. Take Rabbi Adrian. Well, now it's going to have to be dinner because i'll be teaching after services but you guys get involved yeah, it's, it's okay to you know who cares about the mask don't be afraid go out there you can wear it till you get at the table take it off and if you want you can stand way far back you know you can sit off off to the other side of the table um you know and talk but um you know there's what happens when you when you break bread together even enemies when they break bread together can find common ground and when you break bread together, when you when you can lift up lechem and you 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 lift up your drinks and you can fellowship with one another, it get, it puts us in this community where we're we're working together, and that's really what this is all about. It really is. It's not individualism. It really really is corporate. Really stealing my thunder for my Shabbat message. Oh is, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> which is we need to get back to the first century church. Amen. That's great. Well, you know, he's done that to me like two or three times and he doesn't even know it. But I think I think on one of them he probably knew. But no, no. <laughs> but I didn't know I didn't know he was doing that. Um I got his notes, but I didn't I didn't look at what he was speaking on specifically. So um that's great. I can't wait to hear it. It's gonna be exciting. And you know, you guys are gonna have to be patient with worship this weekend because I'm doing worship. So but it'll all be oh, fun. And, uh, <laughs> okay. what's that? You know what? I want to address that right now. Oh. Abba, Father, we do not need to be patient if you anointed. Hallelujah. We just come before your throne right here, right now. And Amen. we ask Amen. for a supernatural Amen. impartation on our brother, our rabbi, our leader, so that he can be used by you in an Amen. awesome Amen. way Amen. to lead us to that place where we can worship you in spirit and, and in, in truth. truth. And, and I truth. thank you in advance for what you're going to do this Shabbat in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen. And All right, guys. Well, I have to use the restroom, but unless you guys have a question and you guys want it answered, I can come. Uh, back. I have one question. I have okay, one. well, then I have to use the restroom. You guys talk among yourself and I'll be right back. Go ahead, Najib. <laughs> What's your question? What is the difference between Hashem and that I'm, I'm blessed. What is the, the difference that Rabbi Bernal was talking about? Oi. Asher and Baruch? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'll wait for him to come back. Okay, let's wait. What, what, what is the difference? Um, I would have great difficulty articulating the difference. So I'll wait for Adrian to come back for that one. 
It's a difficult one. It is. Hmm. Wow. What the, the ashray is more personal. More personal. Okay. But Rabbi Adrian will be back momentarily. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, yeah, I love that we all need one another. Yeah, you need to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for you. <laughs> I asked if the question that's was why, good. Was, yeah, that's you why you get paid the big bucks over there. Right. <laughs> Let me tell you what I did. I kicked the can. You kicked the can. <laughs> down the road yeah. to Adrian. Down the road to Rabbi Adrian. So and, he, the, and he passed the, the buck. Right. I did that too. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All these idioms. Attention. So what is the difference between Asher and Baruch? Again, Baruch, uh, Baruch is how we address God. For the most part, that is what we do. We never say ashray to God because we as human beings, created people, cannot, cannot bless God the way God has already established a blessing for us. And so when we, when, we, when we speak to God, we say, Baruch Adonai, blessed are you, O God. What we're doing is acknowledging his greatness. So when we say Baruch, we're acknowledging, like, like Rabbi said earlier, when he says that when we pray, we, we always, we never thank God. We don't ask God to bless the cup or the wine, or the food, or anything, what we do is we thank him by saying, Baruch, blessed are you, because you've created this sustenance to already bless us, so, so when we speak to God, we don't use this term ashray very often, it's not directed towards him, it's more of him directing it towards us, saying, you guys are blessed, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to pour upon you all my blessings, because I'm the creator, and I'm the one who can do it, you so that's the word used on the on the beatitude. So on the beatitude, but it's also doesn't it also mean happy and like fortunate? Right, right, and it means all those things. But really, what it's talking about is like, for instance, God never has a bad day. <laughs> he's never sad. He's never. He's never. Um, you know what I'm saying? He's never disappointed in himself like some of us are. Okay. Yeah, he looked at creation. Okay. He said it is good. It is very good. Okay. <laughs> so for for him. To use, to use the term ashray to us is saying, listen, through my greatness and my goodness, I'm, you are going to be happy. You are going to be blessed. So that's why this word ashray is used. But when we speak about God, we don't speak those terms because we cannot create happiness. We cannot create goodness to God, right? We can honor him and we can please him and we can walk according to his ways that honor him and show him respect and awe and reverence. But we cannot bless him the way he wants to bless us because we cannot create su substance or any sustenance to bless him or to make him greater than what he is because he's already great. So that's why we use the two terms blessed uh, or baruch. Baruch is directed towards God and ashray is directed typically towards men. Did that, does that help, Najib? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's, it's important that we understand that because... Um, yeah, Rabbi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it never made sense to me say bless God I want him to bless me <laughs> how can I bless him see yeah but yeah so what he's saying what he's saying to us is happy are you how, how exceedingly filled with joy you will get when you walk according to my ways and happiness will find its way in your lives but when we bless him, it's not that way at all. What we do is it's basically if we were to say. Is it an affirmation? Hey, what's that? Is it an affirmation? We're just basically saying what it is. We're saying what it is, but we're also, I mean, another word would be, you know, thankful. You know how we should be thankful for everything and in all things. It says give thanks and in all things. And it's the same way. Thankful to you are we, oh God. We're acknowledging you have, where it's coming have from. Provided sustenance for our family 
You have given us, you've given us the kosher foods. You've given us all these things. And so we are so thankful. So in that way, that Baruch HaTad it's easy for us to just fall into this rabbinical mindset and always just say it and not think mm. much behind it. But it really truly is giving God total, total glory where glory belongs. And that's really what it is. It's like you are glorified God, King of the universe, because you've created the fruit of the vine. There's nothing I can do to create the fruit of the vine. Even if I go out and I take a seed and I plant the seed in soil and then I build the stalks so that the vines can go up the stalks and grapes start to flow and I make great wine and I do all that stuff. There's nothing I created because it all started from the seed that was created by Almighty God, right? The soil was made by Almighty God. There's nothing I can do to create that. So to, to use that term, you know, uh, if I use that term, Baruch, Baruch Ata David or Baruch Ata, you know, Jonathan or Baruch Ata Linda, I'm giving them a, tr a tremendous amount of honor and glory and respect. And I probably shouldn't do that because it's directed. The Bible says that all awe belongs to God. All reverence belongs to God. So it's important that we use Baruch Ata and I blessed are you, O God, because you, des you deserve for us recognizing what you do in our lives. But Ashrei is God saying, listen, you are going to be exceedingly happy and blessed if you walk according to my ways. Because my ways is the way. It's the right way. And Yeshua came in a gentle, humble heart. And, and, and since he's the image of God and the image of all the three in one, here's the beautiful part about that is he didn't come in a haughty, arrogant, prideful attitude and said, hey, listen, listen up. I'm God. No. He says, I came to serve. I came to serve. And he did. He served with his life. So our God is an awesome God because he's a, he's a serving God. So therefore, he, reser he deserves all the glory. All the Baruch Atah, Atahs that we can give him, he, he deserves it. But he's telling us, listen, my son and my daughter, if you, just, if you walk according to my ways and you, and you just put aside yourself, and stop, don't be selfish, and don't listen to evildoers, and don't listen to mockers, and, and establish your, your presence in my way, you will be exceedingly happy and blessed. And so that's the difference between the two. Okay. Good. Any other questions? No. Okay. It was a good teaching, guys. Thank you. I know it's a harder one to understand, but go through it. Again, read, read the part of the anti antithetical um, parallelisms and see that they're just simply two opposing thoughts uh, that teach similar idea. You know, a similar idea. But they're two. And when you break it down into construction, like the A, B, and C, it makes it, you can see it, it just pops out of the page. So if you, if you take some passages and you decide to do it on your own, try to break it down into A and B on the doublets and on triplets, A, B, and C. Very rarely will you see a quadruplet, but there are some out there, okay? But it's mostly doublets and triplets. All right, well, that's it. Unless anybody has another question, but we can close in prayer right now. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful evening. Thank you for us being able to say happy birthday to Sunny, and, and we are so thankful that you brought her in our lives, Lord, and even in my life, Lord, and we are so thankful that you've given her strength and agility. She's like, she told us today that she's 16 in an older body, that's all, because she still thinks like a 16-year-old, and she's still a 16-year-old, and so we thank you for that, Lord, and we just, we give you glory and praise for this teaching. We thank you for all that you're showing us. And Lord, we just uh, want to honor you with our lives and with everything that we lay before you at the cross. And we're so thankful that you have accomplished the work in us and you've started it. I mean, you've started the work and you're going to accomplish it, Lord. Thank you so much. We give you glory over this message and we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to serve you together. By Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. They throw. They throw. Thank you for your questions. He throw. We gather to worship here in the house of the risen sun.